I always feel a certain amount of relief after we finish fields and potential and potential energy because that's probably the hardest part of this course is doing fields and potential. So if you made it through that relatively unscathed, and everybody did more or less made it through relatively unscathed, you might not have done as well as you'd like to have done, but everybody is in a recoverable position. Or some of you are in an excellent position to proceed from here as far as your grades are uh, if you didn't do well, I just want to remind you, continually remind you, that, that I'm available to help you. If, whether it be with your open stats assignments, whether it just be with the material and you're just not getting it, you can come see me. I'll help you in my office hours a week if necessary. Okay? That's my job. They pay me lots and lots of money to do that. So don't think that you're imposing upon me. That's true for all your faculty, by the way, that they pay us to help you to do well. And they don't pay us to give you A's, but they pay us to help you do what you need to do to get that. And that's, that's what we like to do. We're here at Nichols because we enjoy that. You understand? And we like to do lots of other things, but teaching is one of our primary focuses and one of our primary tasks. So if you're following behind, please come see us. That's our job. Okay? So um, anyway, I always find a bit of a relief to move on to capacitors. I think capacitors are a little easier to understand. And then we'll move into circuits really quickly, too. And circuits, frankly, they're just kind of fun to work with. Uh, they're just simple rules that you need to follow. So there are these intuitions that you get about mm -hmm. circuits. And at first, you're going to find it a little bit confusing. But after you practice with them a lot, you'll find that, that they're not that scary after all. Okay, so let's look at capacitors. Uh, we're going to look at a parallel plate capacitor. It just consists of two metal plates of area A separated by a distance D. Right, we've been drawing a capacitor when we were talking about fields and potential. This is a capacitor. I have two metal plates. They sit like this, and they have a certain size. So there's an area A for each of the plates. There's an area A over here. By the way, when I'm talking about the area of a capacitor, I'm not talking about the combined area of the plates. I'm talking about one side or the other. So when I talk about the area, it's just the area of one side of the plate. And usually they're the same area on either side. But I have two metal plates that um, have a certain area, and then they're separated by a distance. They can be really close together, or they can be farther apart. That's a capacitor. When you connect to a battery, the capacitor becomes charged. And stores energy that can be used later. In fact, this is going to be one of the big purposes of capacitors. That's their primary purpose, is to store energy and then use it later. Now, we'll see a little bit later that capacitors are also used for timing circuits. So anytime you have flashing lights or things that recur over and over, that's often a capacitor. But it's still just storing energy. It's storing up energy and then releasing it. Storing up energy and then releasing it. So capacitors are used to store energy. I connect them up to a battery, so this is just a little cartoon. This isn't what a capacitor looks like. I'll show you one, and we'll watch a video about a capacitor soon. This is our battery, like your car battery. You hook it up to a capacitor, uh, and it stores energy onto that capacitor. You get charges, so you get a bunch of little positive charges over here, and a bunch of little negative charges over here. And so there is a potential difference between the two plates. And of course, you know that the uh, potential difference, that's our energy per charge. So it contains energy. It holds energy inside the capacitor. Uh, we define the, the capacitance of a capacitor in this way. So, um, I've already said this, but the area is the area of one plate, not combined. It doesn't really matter that much to you. I mean, when I give you the area, it's going to be the area that you need for a capacitor. I'm never going to give you twice the area for both plates. Uh, but just for semantics, just to let you know. And the charge on the capacitor I'll call them caps for short. 
the charge on the capacitor is going to be Q. So even though I have a plus Q on this side and a minus Q on this side, and by the way, those are going to be equal, right? Because if I have a certain charge over here, I induce the same amount of charge on the other side. So plus Q and minus Q. When I talk about the charge on the capacitor, I just talk about Q. And that's the either the charge on this side or the positive of the charge on this side. Uh, the capacitance is defined by the amount of charge it holds when connected to a battery with a certain potential difference. Uh, I'm just going to say when connected to a delta V. But I'm implying in that that you're connecting it to some power supply, a battery or a power supply like you use in the, in the lab, uh, some source of potential difference. And then that definition, and by the way, we're going to come up with two definitions for capacitance, but this is sort of at the root level, what is capacitance? It is equal to Q over V. Often we'll write this, and I think this is how it's written in your equation sheet, in this way, that we take that definition and we say that the charge on a capacitor is equal to the capacitance times the potential difference, times V. And also, I'm in mind here, I'm not writing the delta, but when I talk about a battery or a power supply, then I'm really talking about the difference in one terminal and the other terminal. So I get a 12-volt battery, you might have zero volts on one terminal, and you have 12 volts on another terminal. And so that's a potential difference of 12 volts, 12 minus zero. But I'm not going to write the delta. I'll just write it as V right now. But as we move into circuits, I'll always be talking about a potential difference. No longer are we worried about the potential at a particular point in space like we did before. Always the potential difference between two points in a circuit. All right, so Q is equal to C times V. Uh, the units for capacitor for capacitance are um, the farad. And this is after Michael Faraday. He lived in the, what, the late 1800s. He did a lot of what we need to know today to produce electricity. He studied magnetic fields, and we'll see a little bit about him in a later chapter. He developed the idea of electric fields to describe electricity, or the force due to do electricity. So Michael Faraday made a lot of the pioneering work that allows us to have electrical devices today. Uh, a farad. If, uh, if C is equal to Q divided by V, and a farad is the unit for capacitance, then a farad is equal to a 1 coulomb per volt. So just to give you a reference, I mean, you'll probably have a simple question like this on the test where I just give you a circuit and ask you what is the capacitance. With that figure that we had where we had a 12-volt battery, connected to a 24 micro or uh, to a capacitor if the charge on that capacitor Q is 24 micro coulombs then the capacitance is going to be Q divided by V or 24 micro coulombs divided by 12 volts which is going to be 2 microfarads and I started drawing a circuit here so before I drew the battery, this is a cartoon figure, but this is actually the symbol that we'll use for a battery. I'll draw this a little bit later for you and show you all the different symbols that we'll use in the circuit. But you have one long line followed by one short line. And then this is the symbol that we'll use for a capacitor. It's two equally link, equal length lines. It looks like a capacitor. It looks like two parallel plates. Now let's try this quick test. Um,
All right, let's stop at 45. 45. You can go on to the next one if you like. Okay, B. It's not right. C2. Y'all doing this top one? Am I right, right? Yes. A is right. On a redo, is that what you said? <laughs> okay, so. Uh, Gosh, that hardly ever happens. Like I usually get, like the majority gets the right answer. That's how I always pick what's the right answer. We go. Oh. See, maybe I'm wrong. Q is equal to C times V, right? That's how we find the amount of charge. And so the capacitor, if I have two identical capacitors, capacitor C1 and C2, they're both the same. Uh, one's connected to five volts, one connected to two volts. The one with the bigger voltage that C1 has more charge. So if C increases, that means Q increases. Okay? Can you follow me? All right. Good job, you five. Um, let's do this next one. You don't know this a priori. Like, there's no reason for you to know the answer to this question. But I think you do know it, I like, guess, intuitively. If you make the plates of your capacitor bigger, they're itty bitty, and then you make them bigger, how does that affect the amount of charge that they can store? Does the charge, can it store more charge, less charge, or the same amount of charge? Don't overthink it too much. If I make my plates bigger, can they store more, less, or the same amount of charge in a capacitor? All right, let's stop at 45. Okay, A is right, good. Uh, if I make my plates bigger, then I can store more charge. There's more space on the plates for you to store charge. Um, what do you call a dinosaur with a good vocabulary? A thesaurus. Uh. <laughs> okay, so let's see, do I have... Well, let's do another question here. So. How is the amount of charge affected if the distance is increased? So with a capacitor, remember we have two properties. We have the area of the plates, and then we also have the distance, D, between the plates. So what happens if we increase the distance between these plates? I have two plates. They hold a certain amount of charge. When I hook them up to a battery, they store a certain amount of charge and then I separate them by a greater distance. How does that affect the amount of charge that they can store? Now, you might not know this intuitively, so let's just see, but I, most often students get it right. If I move those plates farther apart, how does that affect the amount of charge that they can store? All right, let's stop at uh, 35, 35. B is right. So if I move those plates farther apart, they'll store less charge. And no reason why you shouldn't know that necessarily. But you can think of it in terms of, well, I'm sort of spreading that energy out over a larger area, over a larger volume. And so it's not able to gather as much charge. So what I have is a direct relationship between area and charge, or excuse me, between area and capacitance. And then I have an indirect relationship or an inverse relationship between uh, capacitance and distance. Let me write that. So capacitance is directly proportional to area. If A goes up, C goes up. Capacitance is inversely proportional to distance between the plates. If D goes up, C goes down. Oh, this is a question I just asked. I'm sorry. So if the separation is increased, you can store less charge. Okay, so the expression for C that we have, since I have those relationships, is directly proportional to A, inversely proportional to D, and then I always have a constant of some sort, right? This is a uh, 
proportionality constant. This is actually called the permeativity of free space, epsilon naught. We'll come back to that when we get to magnetic fields. It has to do with magnetic fields. It's actually a constant that was wrapped up in that Coulomb's constant that we use for Coulomb's law. So it actually goes back to Coulomb's law. But this is the permeativity of free space. We're not really worried about what it means right now. Okie dokie. All right. Um, Let's try this question. I'm going to write down two things though before we start this because uh, what you want to think about in this question are the interplay between these relationships. That if I change the area, if I have a capacitor in a circuit and I change the area or the distance between the plates, that changes the capacitance. And if that changes the capacitance, then that's going to change either the charge or the voltage. Now in this question, I have a capacitor that's hooked up with a battery of 12 volts. You charge up the capacitor, and you give it a certain amount of charge on that capacitor. And then you take the capacitor out of the circuit. The charge that it has on that capacitor is now locked in. But then I change the dimensions of the capacitor. I want to know what happens to the voltage. Now take a minute and think about this. This is kind of a difficult question. But take a minute and think about it. I'll go ahead and start with a timer. I'm going to sketch out what exactly we're doing here. I have a battery, a capacitor. This is 12 volts. And I get a certain amount of charge here. Then I take out that capacitor. It still has that charge. But then, oh, and it also, by the way, has a potential difference equal to 12 volts that's dependent upon that charge across the capacitor. There's no battery, but across that capacitor. And then I double the plates area. I still keep the same charge, but now I want to know what is the voltage across that capacitor. Look, a lot of you have put either B or C. You're saying that either the voltage will double or the voltage will have. And one of those is right. It's either B or C. That's good intuition because you know that there are no quadratic relationships in these equations that we wrote. So it's not going to quadruple. It's not going to you know, go by a factor of a fourth. It's going to either double or have. Let's go a few more seconds. I'll stop at 140. I don't even know what the answer is. I always have to think through this. So, um, if I double my area, what happens to the capacitance? Increases. It increases. It doubles, in fact. So C is going to increase by a factor of two. However, the charge remains the same because whatever charge I have on that capacitor, I've already put it on there. There's no way for it to change. There's nowhere for it to go. It's not hooked up to anything. So if I double the capacitance here, if Q stays the same, that means that V has to be what? Decrease. It, if this is doubled, this has to have. Is that what you'll put? So it was 12. Now it's going to be 6. Yeah, look at you. That's good. C is right. That's a tricky little question. Like, there's a lot of things that you have to think about as you go through it. We'll see some other similar questions to that soon when we do some more clicker questions. All right, let's talk about dielectrics and we'll watch a little video. Capacitors. Uh, and by the way, this is a capacitor. This is like, anybody ever seen one like this? You know where you find a capacitor like this? It's like in a car stereo. Do you all have really fancy car stereos? We do. Do you? Yeah, we do like in our, in our minivan. It has a really good bass. And then you know, have a radar that will turn up really loud. People. There's nothing handy. It's just stuff. But it's pretty good. Anyway, this is uh, 
a capacitor from a student unit in the new video from a car audio system. Because car audio systems, they, they use a lot of energy. And he used this when he when he had like a, an extra big base punch that it would store up the energy. And the energy that in this capacitor would be used to deliver that big base in the uh, in this car stereo. I'll pass this around if you like. Take a look at it. Uh, notice it says it's for 24 volts, and I think it's a 4 farad capacitor. That's a really big capacitor. A farad is a lot of capacitance. In fact, we'll see that usually when we're talking about capacitance, we're talking about micro or even nanofarads. So don't forget your micro uh, metric prefix. You're going to use it a lot in this chapter, 10 to the minus 6, remember? Um, so capacitors, there are two metal plates that are... Area A separated by a distance B. Often the capacitor will also have a dielectric. A dielectric is anything that's an insulator. The very first capacitor is the dielectric that they use with glass. They actually put lead or some sort of metal onto a glass sheet and a piece of metal on the underside of that glass sheet, and then that was their capacitor. All right, in the video I'll show you, we'll have a. Uh, they use glass jars. These are called. Uh, Glazing jars? You might have heard of those before. I'll show you a video. But those were the very first capacitors where you had sheets of metal sandwiched uh, around a piece of glass. The dielectric serves two purposes. It increases the capacity of the capacitor to store charge. And that's one of the main reasons. In fact, the capacitance C is equal to kappa times C naught. I have it written right here. Kappa is something called the dielectric constant. The dielectric constant kappa is always greater than or equal to 1. Uh, if I put a dielectric into, in between two metal plates, I will always increase the capacitance of that capacitor. And so when I stick something between those two metal plates, that causes it to have a bigger capacity, a bigger capacitance that stores charge. Uh, really, a more practical reason is to keep the plates from touching. Bless you. It's kind of hard, actually, to keep two plates really close together. They can get uh, nanometers apart or micrometers apart. It's really hard to keep those plates from actually touching one another. And if they touch one another, then it just shorts out your circuit. It's like the capacitor is not even there. It's this current flows or electricity flows directly through it without any hindrance at all. So really, the more practical reason is to keep those two plates from touching. In fact, usually in a capacitor, and this one too, and I'll show you one where they split one up. Usually your capacitor looks like this, where they take two metal plates. They have little leads attached to them. So these are two metal plates with little wire leads coming off. And then they put some dielectric in between them. And then what they do is they roll it up. So they'll take those two metal pieces of metal and they'll roll it up. But it has this dielectric in it that keeps it, you get the idea. You ever have a roly-poly? You remember the roly-poly? It's been closed down for some years. Remember the roly-poly down at uh, Tosti's at 7th and uh, now? Where they take two tortillas and they put meat in between them and then they roll them up? That's a lot like a, a capacitor. Uh, a roly-poly. It's like a roly-poly. Okay? All right, I think I have a video for you to watch. Let me go to the next page first. Yeah, we'll go to, let's watch this. Glad to be done with all this business, potential and fields and all that.
All right, let's just do a few more seconds. Uh, we'll stop at, say, 50. 50. Uh, by the way, with your clickers, I put your clicker ID number on Moodle. Make sure you verify that that is your clicker. Uh, a few of you, I think maybe everybody in this class had it, but check if you don't have your clicker ID and you have zero points for class participation, that just means that I, I don't have it recorded properly. So just send me the, the number from the back of your clicker. Okay, good. B is right. This is basically, I think it is the same question as what we had before. All right. So I'm going to go for you. What must be done to a capacitor in order to increase the amount of charge it can hold? Stop at 33, 33. Okay, good. B is right. Uh, I can increase the area of the plates, just make the plates bigger. Or if I bring the plates closer together, it increases that energy density between the plates and allows you to pull more charges onto the plates. This is similar to a question that we had before. Um, I have this capacitor. It's hooked up to a battery of 400 volts. If I double the plate spacing, double the spacing, what happens to the uh, to the voltage or the charge? Decrease or increase the voltage or charge, or maybe both of them change. Let's stop at 53, 53. Yes, the charge decreases. Remember, because if I separate those plates by more, the, the capacitance goes down. That means that the charge is also going to go down. Let me write that, uh, the equation. So when we're thinking about this in equation form, C is epsilon naught. A over D, and then uh, Q is equal to CV. Oh, and by the way, I think in your equation sheet, I actually write it like this, where there's that kappa. That's always implied that if you have our, our dielectric constant, that it's going to increase the capacitance by that amount. So you can write it with a kappa there, too, if you want. Um, so here, I double my plate spacing. So this goes up by a factor of 2. That means this goes down by a factor of a half. So if I have the capacitance, uh, what happens to the charge? The charge is going to have. Now, the important thing here is that it stays connected to the battery. That means that whatever voltage I had here is going to remain the same. That I'm getting 400 volts of potential difference on the battery, and that's going to remain the same on the capacitor. So you might have been confused about that, but when you have a capacitor hooked up to a battery, it's always going to have the same potential. I'm going to skip this one. This one is identical to the one that we had before. Uh, but let me just recap that if I have this capacitor and it's hooked up to a 400 volt battery, and then I take it off the battery, and then I double the plate spacing. You with me so far? Are you okay? Let me step through. Let me show you. So C is equal to epsilon naught A over D. And so I double the plate spacing. This doubles. And so it halves the capacitance. But then I think about this. Q is equal to CV. 
when I disconnect it from the battery, the charge is going to remain the same. Right? I charge it up, I take it out of the circuit, whatever charge I had on that capacitor, it remains the same. And so if I now have the capacitance, I have to double the voltage. So whereas I had 400 volts here, I now have 800 volts. So I think this might have been a little bit different from the previous one. Maybe the, the previous one was changing the area and not the plate spacing. I don't recall. All right. But you'll likely see a question like this where I ask you about what happens to the charge or the voltage on a capacitor when you change its dimensions. And look for those things. Is it staying in the circuit? If it stays in the circuit, it keeps the same voltage. Whatever voltage that battery is providing, it keeps that voltage. <coughs> If you take it out of the circuit, then it keeps the charge. If you charge it up and then you take it out of the circuit, then whatever charge it had on that capacitor is going to remain the same. All right, I'll come back to this. And let's try this one. I'm going to hand back your test soon. Don't forget your epsilon naught. Uh, it's in the back on your equation sheet. If you want to just look back there and get a feel for where it is, I think it's in the upper left-hand corner of your equation sheet. Just calculating the capacitance. C is kappa epsilon naught A over D. All right, let's try to wrap up in about 10 seconds, 15 maybe. Stop at 2.30, bless you. 2.30, just a few more seconds. Okay, good, B is right. I uh, just want you to know what, I, what the variables mean and how to calculate the capacitance. C is equal to kappa. Epsilon naught A over D. That is uh, 1.5 is kappa. That's our dielectric constant. Epsilon naught is that 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12, right? Minus 12. Uh, and then A is 0.4 meters squared. It's already an SI unit, so I didn't need to convert that, but watch that as well. Times 1 times 10 to the minus 6. And what was the answer? B. So that works out to be uh, 5.3 times 10 to the minus 6 farads or 5.3 microfarads. Make sure you know your micro. You'll see a lot of micros in this next chapter because often capacitors are, are microfarads. Um, let's do symbols and circuits and then we'll, I'll hand back your test. So we've already seen some of these symbols, and we're going to be seeing them a lot in the next couple of chapters, the next several chapters. For a battery, 
our symbol looks like this. One big side, one little side. Sometimes you'll have extra stuff written on the symbol. might look like this where you'll have, say, the voltage written down below it, 12 volts, or whatever the voltage is. Sometimes you'll also have a plus or a minus. Those are the high and low potential sides of the battery. On a circuit, by the way, on your power supply, this will be your red side, and this will be your black side. In your circuit, it won't be red or black, but if you're using a power supply, that's what the red and black means. The red is the high potential side, the black is the low potential side, or sometimes it's called the ground. The capacitor looks like this. Sort of looks like what it is, two parallel plates. Though sometimes, uh, I think to help distinguish it from the battery, which it looks a lot like the battery, sometimes you'll see it looking like this instead, with a straight line and then a curved line. We won't use that symbol. Instead, I'll use, uh, I'll use this symbol the two parallel plates. And then resistors, some of y'all have probably already seen resistors. Are y'all doing circuits yet in a lab? Mm -hmm. What are you doing, uh, resistors in series and parallel? Mm -hmm. Good. All right, so resistors look like this, just squiggly lines like a heartbeat, sort of. Uh, they're supposed to be all even. That's a resistor. Not much changes about that. You might have the, the value below it, say two ohms or whatever it is. We'll see these next chapter. And then sometimes you might have a variable resistor. And that looks like that. This is a variable resistor. You won't see that in this class, but you see it in the lab. That's when you use the rheostat. That's what a variable resistor is. That big long metal tube that you move the thing up and down. Or uh, soon you'll be using the decade resistance boxes. There'll be a box with a bunch of little knobs on it. That's a variable resistor. It's just a resistor that can change its value. Let me hand back your test.